So, the first one, I went to a keynote around two years ago with one of the co-founders of Google and he was speaking about all this futurist stuff and whatever. And when it got to questions, one of the people uh, in the audience said, mate, no one really gives a fuck, you just cruise around on your yacht all day and you're worth billions. And so, this guy just said, and he said, hey dude, cool, tell me about some of the problems you experience in your business. And I'm just making this up, I can't remember exactly. He said, oh, I get like seven to 10 problems a day. One of them is the chairs and furniture break, and the other one is my staff argues. And the dude from Google said, cool man, well guess what? What happens to me at Google is exactly the same thing. There's seven to 10 problems a day, they're just on a bigger scale. For example, my buildings break down, uh, burn down, and my staff kill each other. Same problems, bigger scale, right? So all of us face the same thing, no matter who you are, and no one's got an easy ride. The second story I want to tell you is about thinking about things differently. My parents said I could have $20,000 if I didn't get expelled from high school. So I didn't get expelled from high school. And when I finished, I said, look, mom and dad, I, sorry, at that time, context, I've been playing World of Warcraft. In fact, I was the number one ranked warlock in the world at level 17. Not that anyone in the room cares about that. <laughs> but the point is, I was really good and I played a lot. And I said to them, look, all these dudes that I've been hanging out with on World of Warcraft are talking about this thing called Bitcoin. I know on World of Warcraft they have swords and all this kind of stuff, and they sell it through an auction house with this stuff called WoW Gold, and then some of them sell it to people in real life for real money. I think this is pretty cool. This Bitcoin thing is interesting. I want to put my $20,000 into Bitcoin. In 2007, Bitcoin was at $2. Do you know how much money I would have right now? Approximately $60 million. My parents said, shut up, fuck with, go and spend it on a real business. Thanks, mum and dad, cool. They said, go and be a personal trainer or a steel fixer. Yeah, awesome, great, thanks, mum and dad. The best part about the story is, is the founders of Ethereum, Bitcoin, and EOS, which are three major platforms in the crypto world, all met in World of Warcraft. So not only could I be worth 60 million, I could have also founded one of these companies, because some of them were in my guilt. And the last piece of the story, which is the best bit, is my mum is the CEO of the biggest world health company in the world. And approximately a year ago, I said to her, Mum, I've been hearing about this stuff called blockchain. I think it's pretty rad. I heard it's the next thing since internet, and it's the thing that's the precursor to serious AI, where you download your brain into a tablet or whatever. You said, Steve. And so, instead of her saying, you're a fuckwit, go away, she went and she started Googling stuff and she started going to crypto conferences and blockchain conferences and she quit her job and now she's starting up a blockchain consultancy. Yes! <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. The last piece of the, uh, sorry, the last story that I have to share is about entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurship, yes, is a well overused word and no, I don't think I am one. But what I think it is, is sort of saying, cool, well you think this works, that's your perception, I'm gonna do it this way, and if I do it wrong, you know, I've either made a small mistake, or you're gonna slap me on the wrist and I'll say sorry. I'm really good at saying sorry now. So, when I was 17, I moved to London to start a luxury women's shoe label. I studied London College of Fashion, and at the end of the uh, three and a half years that I was there, I presented a 22 piece collection that was fully made by a factory. How did I do that? Your first collection of shoes actually cost 250,000 pounds if you're doing a 22 piece with multiple colors, right? This is women's high heels luxury. 250 grand before you even know a store or a woman would buy them or like them. That's a pretty crazy investment, especially for a 17 year old. So I thought, how am I gonna get my first collection made for me? I mean, I don't have 250 grand and it'd take me forever to save that up and I'm not gonna get money from a bank for sure. So I approached the factory and I said, look factory, I'm going to work for you the next three and a half years for free. And at the end of the next three and a half years, you're going to make my shoe collection. So I basically swapped them the time I had after university, before university, and on the weekends. They said yes, so I did it. And for the first time in luxury fashion history, three large department stores bought into the collection when I presented at London Culture Fashion. So, I got my shoes, I put them in a shoe suitcase, I took them home and I started spamming people. Long story short, I spammed the shit out of David Jones in Sydney and they wouldn't have a bar of me. So I sent them a message and I said, okay cool, I'm coming anyway. 
I turned up to David Jones, I took the back exit, and I went to press level eight, which is where they're located. I don't know if they are anymore. And there was a lady, I think her name was Kylie. She was the shoe buyer. I just found her on LinkedIn. And I said to the lady, oh, I can't get up to level eight. She said, yeah, you need access or an invitation. What's your name? And I said, John Fairweather. And she looked at her Refidex and there was no John Fairweather. I tried to lie, I can't remember what I said. And she said, get out or I'll call security. So with my towel between my legs, I went back into David Jones and I was whirling around my shoe suitcase. And I saw a man who looked like a concierge for David Jones. His name was John. He was wearing a Gerard Perigot watch, of which I was too. I'd just come back from Geneva. I, ha I said to him, hey, is that a Gerard Perigot? And we started talking about it. Five minutes later, I said to him, John, I'm trying to get up to level eight. I've got a buying meeting. Can you show me how to get there? He took me to the inside lift, took me up to level eight, and there I was. I said to the lady at the front, look, uh, I've got a meeting with Kylie. Was that the name I used? Anyway, Kylie, whatever her name was. And uh, I've just got off the plane from Geneva. That was a lie. Being home for two months over Christmas. I'm feeling really jet lagged and sick. I just want to put my collection up, show it to her and get out, go home and have a nap. She said, okay, darling, come with me. And she took me over to the room. And I set it all up. And then she went back to her desk and she got on the phone and she called Kylie. I could hear her on the loudspeaker, you know, she had those old school phones. And she said, hey, Kylie, John's here for your buying meeting. And she said, literally word for word, how the fuck did he get in here? <laughs> anyway, the, the uh, admin lady said, well, you might as well go and see him because he's sitting there. So she walked in. I literally chucked the shoes at her. I said this whole speech and I said, yo, literally, I'm not leaving until you take the shoes. You can call security if you want. In the end, she just took the shoes and said, God, just get out. So I was the first person in luxury women's shoe history to be in David Jones in their first season ever. How did I do it? It wasn't about complaining, it wasn't about keeping things to myself, it wasn't about following the rules, it was just fuck it, I'm gonna do it and we'll see what happens. And the worst anyone can say is no, and they probably won't find me for whatever I'm doing anyway. So there are my three stories. So, uh, a little thing about Little Tokyo 2, uh, what, when I finished up with the shoe company, I actually sold it to a private equity group when I was 21. I came back and I decided I wanted to do something more impactful, something where I could actually use the skills and knowledge that I learned in London uh, building a company uh, and help people that I really cared for. So I said to my friends, how you doing, what's going on? Some of them start coffee shops, some of them start fashion brands, whatever, normal sort of small business things. And I said, cool, well, let's play golf and we'll talk about it. And all of them were too busy to play golf and I didn't really understand. So I said, fine, I'll come and have a coffee and we'll talk about what's going on. And all of them said, I'm bored, lonely, lost, unmotivated. When I'm meant to be doing work at home, I'll play Xbox or Facebook or whatever it is. No one giving me directions, no one to bounce my ideas off. I said, hmm, well, how much do you pay rent? You know, maybe they said 500 bucks a month. And I said, cool. Well, what if I use the money from the shoes to buy a house? You guys move in, you all pay rent normally, but as kind of like the guy who owns the house, I'll be like your advisor. So if you want to meet the CEO of Optus, or you want to do whatever it is, or you're facing the same troubles I had before, I'll fix it or solve it for you. They said, cool, as long as we can drink beer. And I said, cool. So I went looking for a place. I ended up buying the oldest Japanese restaurant in Australia. And the essence at the very beginning was work with people you really love, who are inspired, and do anything you can to help them. And that's the same exact essence as we have today when we have six buildings. Uh, we have, I don't know how many startups slash small businesses we have, maybe 1,200. Uh, we've had two IPOs that started with us, went all the way through to IPO and outgrew us. Our general success boundary is when someone comes to us with their idea and a small team, one, two or three people, and we help them all the way through the validation, the growth stage, and then support their scale. And they end up leaving us with a 10 or 12 person sustainable, scalable team. To date, we've done that 74 times and we've been running for only two and a half years. Uh, and between all of the 74 companies, not including the IPOs, we've helped them raise over 50 million Australian dollars, cash injection into their companies to grow. Those kinds of statistics over two and a half years are pretty good, I think. So, what kind of things could Beanley do to attract biz like big business or innovative business, etc.? 
I've written a, a few things. Uh, I think identifying key influences within the community is really important. It's all well and great to get all of these sticky notes, but if someone doesn't put their hand up to drive that key vertical themselves, it's probably going to fizzle out. Uh, Co-create value, points of your region, that's what you're doing. Create a story about being lead. Uh, Digital Brisbane and Brisbane Marketing in Brisbane, of course, has spent a lot of time and effort surveying important people and the community around what they believe the essence of Brisbane is and what we should tell uh, local and international people about Brisbane so that we have a collective, uh, you know, synchronous voice. And then obviously get involved with Advanced Queensland. I hope that everybody in this room knows what Advanced Queensland is. It's basically a state government initiative. It has plenty of money behind it, and all they're doing is driving startups, innovation, small business, giving away grants, helping people learn, helping people grow. And then, who actually are you trying to attract? Just like a small business should, you need to understand your target. So if you are trying to target a Google or whoever to move to being lead, you better understand your story and your offering and know how to speak to them. That's all I'm going to say uh, on that. Reinvention, uh, reinventions of your company. We built one of our spaces out at Springfield uh, because we knew that that was a future facing place. It's only got about 30,000 people. And we thought because the people that move out to Springfield, yes, they, they possibly could be bud budget conscious, but most of them believe that Springfield can be a great future of the city, just like Maha says. So, we went out there, we built a little token, we did anything and everything we ever could to bring people together to help them out and you know, provide them with the value we have for those other 76 businesses, 74 of which are very big companies now and two of which have IPO. And we might put on Steve as a speaker or something like that and guess how many people turn up? Five, maybe less. We might put on a, a free digital seminar you know, for, for whatever it might be to help you transform your business and guess how many people showed up. Maybe for that time. It baffles me that people don't want to change. Change is uncomfortable. It's probably less uncomfortable than having negative money in your bank account. So I don't understand why you're not doing it. I don't understand why people aren't continuously reading and developing and getting out there and not just going to, I'm not judging the chamber here, I've never met them, but going to chambers and just selling shit to each other, like pot plants or whatever, it doesn't make sense to me. Put that stuff online. We have a company in Springfield, Little Tokyo. We have a cafe, they do these really incredible cakes and we have a really incredible social media person. Right now they're getting the same traction with their cakes that Donut Time did with their donuts. Why can't everyone do that? Of course they can, you just need to experiment, just like Steve said. In terms of reinvention within your business, it's all about leadership and the clarity of your vision. If you aren't clear on what your vision is, take some time away and actually create one. One that people can buy into, find people that will buy into it and attract talent that want to be part of it, and then continuously ram it down their necks. Make it really clear, make it easy to understand, and people will buy into it. I'm not joking when I say PR is whatever I tell you over and over and over again, it becomes true. That's the whole point of it. It's the same as running an innovative, small, agile company. You make a strategy that everyone can buy into, and then you continually reinforce why they're there and what we're doing it for, and you give people autonomy to do it. What others have done, uh, you have seen, uh, a lot of people in the room will have seen the Capital. Uh, it was an initiative uh, by Brisbane City Council, the Lord Mayor, and the vehicle is Brisbane Marketing. They put $5 million behind a building to be the flagship space in Queensland uh, for startups and innovation. What really has formed with the Capital is spectacular. And it's not because we're there, Fishburners there, or the $5 million. What happened was because Council put their money where their mouth is. They picked really great operators to be there. We've been able to involve high school, small business, startup, big business, enterprise, council, and government in that building working with each other because we facilitate opportunities. They get together on events and we force collaboration. Collaboration doesn't happen naturally. If you think it does, you're lying to yourself. Redlands are doing a really great thing. They're following in the footsteps of the State Library of Queensland and Brisbane. I'm not saying that the council or anyone should bank $5 million into a building, or let alone 13. 
I'm saying that you start small, uh, as we've, we've expressed this entire day, and maybe you start with spare space that exists, use some shitty furniture, and actually start delivering value and actually caring about helping each other. That's the entire way my business model runs. No one cares how nice our furniture is. No one cares if we're in the library or the wherever. They care that they're getting value, their problems are getting solved quicker, and that they're growing. Collaborative ecosystems. Like I said, getting everybody involved is really, really important. I don't know if you guys know, but in Logan, uh, there's Griffith and there's Tafe. They are really huge, really amazing, really future-facing organizations. Tafe are doing entrepreneurial web series every other day. Griffith are bu building a bleeding edge creative facility. They're gonna start building their entire sort of entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem around social impact. Every business here should be getting interns and getting involved in as many events and activities as they can with what they're doing. Because they're the big guys that can make a big difference in smaller places like Bingley. Thank you.